Thanks, Nick. So thanks everybody for joining us uh, a little bit earlier hour. It is not early, however, for our uh, speaker. It is about 5 p.m. in uh, Finland where, uh, and I, just, I did a quick Google, it's also about 20 degrees latitude farther north uh, for Kimo uh, Kahelian. And uh, we're very grateful that he accepted Andrew Muir's invitation to come speak to us. Uh, about European whitefish divergence in Northern Fennoscandia. I didn't ask him how to pronounce that one. Uh, but but Kimo uh, received his PhD actually from the University of Helsinki in 2004 uh, on a similar topic, uh, ecology of St. Patrick whitefish morphs in a subarctic lake. Um, he previously had a professorship of applied ecology at the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences and um, he is now the uh, Professor of Environmental Research at the Lamy Biological Station at the University of Helsinki. And we're really grateful to have this opportunity to have uh, uh, sort of this cross-fertilization sharing of ideas uh, among similar, similar questions of Corgonine species just uh, in Europe. And of course, I think Andrew and Kimo got to know each other through the Corgonine Symposium, which happened every three years. Um, Andrew, did you want to say anything else before we turn it over to the chemo? No, just that I've always been impressed by the work that the uh, Scandinavians are doing around Corrigonian's uh, chemo and his colleagues, uh, really remarkable work and some great diversity that in many ways parallels what we see here in the Great Lakes. So uh, I, I've, uh, I grew fond of chemo's work over the years and uh, it's really, an, on, on, it's great for him to present this work to us here. So we really appreciate him uh, participating. Thanks, Kimo. Well said. All right. Floor is yours, Kimo. Thanks again. Yes. Many, many thanks organizers for this invitation. It's always nice to talk about the favorite species, whitefish. So, so I hope you can see my slides and also hear my talk. So, today's talk, I will talk about the northern Fennoscandian European whitefish. So, it's a Scandinavian peninsula that includes Norway, Sweden, and Finland. And just on this first slide, I'll depict on the diversity of Corregonids in this region, from one to many, many mobs in each lake. So, just a First slide, a bit of structure of my talk. I will first talk about the diversity and polymorphism on Corregonids. Then I move on the recolonization of the whitefish in northern Penoscandia. A bit about the origins of whitefish and the genetic divergence, moving then on ecomorphological divergence, food web considerations, finally on the most important reproductive isolation and gene flow, and then try to summarize all of, the, all of these topics briefly. So if we first move on on the diversity and polymorphism of Corregonids, we know these species are centered here in the northern, near the polar regions. It's many different species. So on the European whitefish, uh, the lake whitefish, but then also the mountain, mountain whitefish, prosopium, stenodus, and also ciscos in both sides of, of the uh, Atlantic. Notable thing with the Corregonids is that we should always keep in mind that their distribution here can be characterized by the repeated glaciations. And this um, graph illustrates the extent of the glacial periods around 20,000 years back. So after these glaciations, uh, Oregonids has diverged in many uh, different mobs or species. And here, especially whitefish and cisco has been, has been grown to divergence. So in European side, it's quite often that you see quite many different types of mobs of European whitefish, whereas on the North American side, 
these goals are especially prone to diverge in, in different species and modes. So then we move on the recolonization of whitefish in northern Fennoscandia. So also in this region, glaciation was um, very strong around 20,000 years back when the whole Scandinavian peninsula and also surrounding areas were under the thick ice cover. It's a, it was around two kilometers of ice around this point. And all the species, including Koreconits, had to recolonize the region when the ice retreated. So <clears throat> in northernmost Fennoscandia, this is Finland, Norway, Russia, and Sweden, whitefish colonized this region from the east, from the glacial refuges, and it's the most common species throughout the different lakes and also different water uh, courses of the reach. It's on this region, the most common is that you find one whitefish mob. It is this uh, shaped whitefish. It's a relatively large body size and it has an intermediate number of gill rakers. It is called large parsley raker whitefish that combines the body size and gill raker information. Second most common uh, type of lakes has two mobs where we still have large sparsely raked whitefish, but then also the densely raked whitefish, which is quite typically smaller sized mob with dense skill rakers. The complex lake types, they have uh, three different mobs, two previous ones, large sparsely raked whitefish and densely raked whitefish, but then also small sparsely raked whitefish, very low number of gill rakers and usually a bit smaller size than large sparsely raked whitefish. If we sum up on, on, on the environmental information of the lakes using principal component analysis, having just basic uh, information on the maximum depth area perimeter of the lake, nutrients and, and the seki depth, we can see that the lakes tend to cluster. So these most complex lakes tend to be a bit larger, deeper and a bit more productive than uh, lakes with only one white this mob, which used to be a bit smaller, shallower and clear water lakes. So when you have enough resources and habitats, white fish tend to be more divergent. So, if we then move on on the origins of whitefish and genetic divergence in this region, this is uh, mitochondrial DNA data from the Cytochrome B, where Chat and Östby combined uh, quite massive a number of lakes from Europe and different mobs. So you can see the uh, ancestral lineages include especially the northern blue one and then the south and these red, red ones, but also a bit on the yellow on the eastern, eastern lakes. If we then look on the mitochondrial based, um, uh, the um, hierarchical tree, we can see um, the um, North American, like an outgroup, and then the European Alps and Baltic Sea region here, and then northernmost Fennoscandia. And this um, left, left hand side illustrates, like on, on the whitefish, you can see the lake names and then the different mobs. So the boxes will combine uh, the lake itself. Lake Fem has most of the populations that was on. Chatham's home lake in that region. What is notable here in the northernmost Europe is that the, even if you have many mobs in the lakes, they tend to originate from a single ancestor. On the southern uh, region, southern Europe, you may have a couple of lineages that colonize the same lakes. Then, if we move back on Northern Europe, we did make a mitochondrial DNA uh, analysis on different 
uh, lake types with different whitefish modes. So we focused on three water courses, Harsvik, Tana, and Alta Kautokeina water course. Each of the water courses we sampled three lakes, and all of them had three whitefish modes. We used 21 microsatellites to look about the genetic divergence within these different lakes. So you have here the water courses in both axes, and then you have uh, from the lake name and the mob name, densely raked, large sparsely raked, and small sparsely raked, where the D, L, and S comes. So if we then look on the colors, the light colors, the yellow ones, indicate that you don't have that much genetic divergence. You have the same mob here, so you can see that that's the most closest. The key thing here is that if you look on the water coast level, you can see that within the past week, you see a lot of uh, red color here. So the mobs are quite distinct, but when you move up towards the west, where the white is colonized these lakes, they tend to get much more lighter. So there is much more similarity on the genetic structure, whether it's the different mobs or different lakes. Some cases even suggesting that they were colonized by just in two waves of densely and large sparsely raked whitefish. Whereas in this oldest water course, they tend to have the lake specific divergence, especially like on the profundal mode. So if we then move on the ecomorphological divergence of whitefish mobs in this region. So <clears throat> I will mainly focus on the most complex lake types, where we have actually four different whitefish mobs present. We have large sparsely raked whitefish that is considered like an ancestral mob with the intermediate number of gill rakers. Then densely raked whitefish that is a pelagic mob with the very high number of gill rakers. We have also another large pelagic mob, large densely raked whitefish, still quite many gill rakers around the same level as the small one. And then we have the profundal small sparsely raked whitefish with very low number of gill rakers. So this is just a line drawing to illustrate where these mobs live. So large sparsely raked whitefish is a littoral species eating on the benthic invertebrate. Small sparsely raked whitefish is a profundal deep water mob eating on uh, benthic macroinvertebrates, especially chironomids and small clams. Two pelagic mobs is that the densely raked whitefish, that is a small size, is completely focusing on the plankton diet. The large mob use uh, quite a bit of plankton, but also surface insects from top of the lake. So we have studied this divergence of these mobs in many different proxies. This one is from the stabilized top data on the delta-13 carbon and delta-15 nitrogen. Well, the data that you can put on the mixing models to track down on the main energy sources of these mobs. Here you have the proportion of the diet uh, that comes from three major habitats, littoral, profundal, and pelagic. So small sparsely raked whitefish uh, gets its diet mainly on the profundal, large sparsely raked whitefish mainly on the littoral, densely raked whitefish from the pelagic, uh, large densely raked whitefish from the pelagic, as well as the small densely raked whitefish. Uh, they are very similar to Vendes that is present also in some of these lakes. Brown trout is usually on this lake. It's a large size and it's mainly pelagic. Fish, part of it is on the littoral. Pike is a littoral fish. We also look at uh, the fatty acid composition of these uh, Vendes and white fish mobs. We analyzed around 40 different fatty acids, of which around 20 was informative that were studied with the linear discrim discriminant analysis. Uh, the first uh, axis, uh, the function one, explained most of the variation. 
and some of the variation was explained by second axis. The main thing is that just with the first split, the Vendays and Whites were quite distinct. The same data on the more resolution was put on the analysis where you have the four white piece mobs and Vendays. So Vendays has still this rightmost axis, all the white piece are here. Interestingly, closest to Vendays is the pelagic small densely rated white piece mob. Next is the large one, then you have the profundal small sparsely rated white piece, and then the littoral large sparsely rated white piece. So the axis, first axis is just littoral pelagic axis that will nicely divide all of these mobs. And it is somewhat, you know this already, you have been working with the Coregon, it's on your side. It's somewhat just that describes the lipid gradient. We know that the littoral fish tend to be less lipid rich than the ciscos in the open water habitat. So we just uh, compared the results from the stable isotope analysis of carbon and then the most informative uh, fatty acid in this case, that was muristic acid, 4T. So what is notable, we have two groups here. One is the littoral group, pike, uh, the um, large sparsely raked white piece, and also a benthic profundal white piece mob. All the pelagic are here. So to my eyes, this also somehow describes the lipid axis. It happens to be 14, this muristic acid that will actually divide these things, but, but it could be something else on the different, different systems. So we also went on the other proxies. We use quite a bit of mercury in various ecological questions, but also with the white piece molds. Here is the mercury content and here is the white piece age. We had uh, three lakes with four mobs and three lakes with only one mob, large sparsely raked white piece. If we look at the three lakes with many mobs, we can see some general patterns. We can see that the, these black dots here are always the small pelagic mob. They are always here in the higher level. Next one is the large pelagic mob in each of three cases. Then we get the profundal small sparsely raked white piece. And finally, at the lowest level, we get the large sparsely raked littoral mob. When only one mob is present, we can see there is no significant relationship in all, of the, all the cases. There is some variation between the lakes, but generally the slopes, mercury bioaccumulation slopes are quite shallow in all of these cases. So then if we look on how the mercury correlate with other relevant ecomorphological measurements, we have age-corrected mercury here because mercury is so strongly correlated with the age, you need to age correct it. And then we look at against the Gilraker count, we can see that mercury increase. Okay, once more, the black dots are the polymorphic lakes and the white dots are the monomorphic lakes. So we can see that the Gilraker number correlates positively with the mercury. If you are more pelagic, you contain more mercury. Same is true with the pelagic diet. Then we have the uh, stable isotope of carbon. Pelagic is here, littoral is here. Again, correlation. CNN carbon nitrogen elemental ratio is derived from the stable isotope analysis all the time. It can be used as a proxy for lipid content. So, three illustrates lean, non lipid rich fish, whereas increasing ratio gives you more lipid rich fish. So it once again illustrates that pelagic mob tend to be a bit more lipid rich and they uh, contain more mercury. It's good to note that this amount of lipids is very low. It's kind of, if you have Arxar or lake trout, you easily get the ratios up to six, seven or more. Maximum length from the von Bertalan growth equation, pelagic mob tend to be a very small size at their maximum length they have more mercury and the littoral mob tend to get much larger size. P 
PC1 is from the principal component analysis, just giving a morphometric score on each of the population. These are more pelagic ones, and these are more littoral ones. You get uh, also quite clear relations. So if we then look on whitefish divergence in a wider food web context, we were interested to look on how these whitefish intraspecific divergence affect the stable isotope niche used by them, whether they influence on the predator uh, niche size or overall food web structure. Once again, we focus on the six different lake types on two regions around the same latitude. We have the monomorphic systems, and then we have three lakes with four different modes. This is stable isotope derived data. This illustrates the carbon axis, and this is the nitrogen axis. When you compare the lakes, you need to uh, standardize uh, the stable isotope uh, ratios using the baselines, where we use the littoral snails and pelagic two plankton to get the littoral reliance, as well as the tropic position. The upper row is the monomorphic whitefish populations, and the lower row is the polymorphic whitefish populations. We have standardized the size using a maximum of 30 individuals per mob, and also within the monomorphic populations that you have maximum of 120 individuals in each plot. And this convex hole illustrates the largest isotopic niche, just circling the outermost uh, dots. And the ellipse is derived from the stable isotopes, uh, this cyber model that is more or less like a 95% confidence interval uh, isotopic niche. So if you generally look, uh, there is variation on these uh, monomorphic populations, but they tend to be much smaller than when you have all the mobs combined to the convex hull or the isotope ellipse. So the divergence of the mob, mobs increased isotopic area, and especially like on the horizontal area that they use the different kind of niche from the, the uh, littoral all the way to pelagic, but also that they elevate it a bit on the tropic position when you have the profundal mob here, that tend to be a bit higher location than littoral or pelagic mobs, because they eat somewhat in the uh, next tropic level when they use the profundal kairos, quite typical on many deep water fish. Then we look on the predators of whitefish mob. In this case, it's a brown trout. Again, we have the lakes with only one whitefish mob, and then the lakes with many whitefish mobs. Notably here is that the brown trout tend to be a bit lower level, uh, tropic level, mainly feeding on invertebrates and some of the fish. And they tend to be uh, bit variable positions, in the meat, or in some cases, even more on the pelagic side, but generally the isotopic niche is relatively small. Whereas when you have the all the mobs, you get also the pelagic mob that is the main prey for brown trout. So it elevates the tropic position of brown trout to around uh, 3.5 to 4 tropic position, and also tend to move them. If the littoral is here around one, they tend to be a bit more pelagic, at least on Inarian border lakes. So uh, predator tropic position increase and also the position changes. On the overall food web, the same lakes again here, the green ones, LSR in this row with only one mob, or with the many mobs are the whitefish, but then you have all all the other species, like on Arctic shark, lake trout, for example, here, brown trout and bird here. If you just look on the fish community level isotopic or convex hull, you can see that there is uh, quite a bit of variability between the lakes. But if you compare the upper row towards the 
uh, lower row where you have the many mobs you can still see that the white is tend to kind of horizontally diverge the isotopic area in some cases also elevate the overall like a tropic position occupied by the fish community so definitely have effect on on the whole whole community and the uh, isotopic area of that so then we start to move towards the last part of the talk the main question always within this uh, white dish mob so any coragonids is the level of reproductive isolation and gene flow among them so i will here focus on a couple of case studies uh, just to illustrate how prone these fish are actually to hybridize and mix with, with each other the first one comes on, on one subarctic lake, this Raha Lake, where we end up on completely other topic initially to look on the population densities of, of, of the white fish and vendes. But we noticed that it it's contains quite interesting other aspects. So this lake, Vendes, the European Cisco, this guy here, was introduced uh, to 87 to 90s in three different occasions and it is established on the lake so we went there sampling uh, uh, 15 to 18 years later depending on they don't know exactly which which of the year the true establishment happened and and uh, we find out that it's on it's on quite strange looking like on coragonids in the lake so we find this like a white fish type of looking fish and the Vendes type of looking fish, but also something that looks a bit in between them, classified as a hybrid in the field. And get these kind of sample sizes for more detailed analysis on the ecomorphology, but also the neutral uh, population genetics by seven microsatellites in this case. So <clears throat> this is how the data looks like with the structure run. We have this white fish cluster, Vendes cluster, and hybrid cluster based on just outlook parents. And here, orange is a white fish, blue is Vendes. So we can see that these were quite clean, and the hybrid was something in between. But there was also something interesting here in the so-called purely classified fish. So we take this data on more fine scale analysis called program called new hybrids. And this is, is more prone to divide the data on, on more finer clusters. So you have still the white fish is orange, Vendes is blue, but then you have also yellow bars that marks uh, the F1 hybrids pink f2 they are very small proportions here uh, green is backross to white fish and purple is backross to vendex so we can still see that the pure clusters were mainly uh, white fish or vendex but they also contain that morphologically you think that you know what it is it was indeed like this case completely green bar it was backross to white fish also in Vendes, it contains some F1 hybrids and also uh, purple backros to Vendes. The hybrid category was actually quite interesting. We think it was uh, F1s, but it was actually quite the mix of uh, backros, uh, the white piece of backros to Vendes indeed. And even some of the misclassification completely. So if you combine these uh, genetic assignments or groupings with the ecomorphological data. So this is assignment as a white fish. So it's one if it's a purely a white fish. So you can see uh, these different groupings here, white fish as a white dot, Vendes as an invert triangle, and then you have the backross, the Vendes backross, the white fish and F1. So you can see White fish cluster is here with the lowest amount out of kill rakers. Vendes is here with the highest number of kill rakers. The F1s are just in between. And then you have uh, back cross to white fish 
than backrows to Wendex. So they somehow make this kind of continuum where you have the kill rakers and then you have the groupings here as a box plot. So continuum from the whitelist to Wendex, all variation. Also, if you look just on the overall morphology, where we use around 20 linear measures on the discriminant function analysis that divide most of the variation with the two first axes, you can see the same thing here that you have the whitest cluster here and the Vendes cluster here, F1s just in, in between, and then the back crosses in, in both sides. So it's a continuum. So we also look another case study on the white transplant experiment in a subarctic lake. This is in the western Lapland. It was uh, uh, around one square kilometer lake with all three major lake habitats, littoral, pelagic, and profundal available. And, and uh, Natural after the natural colonization, there was no whitefish because of the migration barriers. It's quite steep uh, river coming down on the lake. But there was uh, in 1960s there was a, a strong attempt to uh, get uh, more profitable fisheries in in this kind of mountain lake. So whitefish was introduced there, and we went on this lake in. Uh, 2011, around 10 generations after the uh, uh, whitefish introduction. And this was what we saw there. We found out on the lake that it was uh, uh, very different looking like the whitefish in the system, looking like a mobs, despite that it was only a single introduction in the system. So we were wondering that whether it could be a kind of experiment on the ecological opportunity available on this type of lake, that whether it's a sympatric speciation. So <clears throat> we also um, measured once again a lot of different kind of data to look on this uh, fish captured from the littoral, pelagic or profundal. Age, not that much difference, but the size was very distinct. So littoral was once again also in the dish system, the largest size, pelagic was a smaller and the profundal was also quite small small piece. Same is the weight. And then it's also differences on the gonad weight. Uh, also on the parasites. This is a pelagic parasite derived from the plankton. So pelagic uh, individuals had higher parasite amounts compared to littoral or profundal. The diet was very different, especially on the littoral and pelagic. Uh, and also on the profundal, which used much more pelagic diet than, than the littoral fish. Gilraker counts also kind of follow on the observations from the true polymorphic systems, littoral with the lower amount, pelagic higher, profundal was somewhere in between. Uh, stable isotopes, they also document this littoral fish here, pelagic more depleted here, and profundal around the same. Same. This is uh, uh, a mistake. This is the nitrogen. You can see that the littoral were at the lower level compared to the pelagic and profundal, making sense. Not much on the elemental races, the liver isotopes basically supporting uh, the muscle ones. The mercury also saw a difference, especially without the um, age adjustment, where the littoral had the lower mercury compared to the pelagic and profundal. Bit less pronounced here, but still significant. So then we go on this genetic uh, data on, on this. So uh, we use the rat sequencing uh, using over 15,000 loci on 61 whitefish individuals. And, and this is how the data looks like. So A here just illustrates the habitat goals. We also uh, have the different signs for each of the white fish mobs, littoral, pelagic, and profundal that are followed up on some of the other illustrations. So how it looks like on the genome-wide divergence absolute. So you can see here 
the the level of the divergence. So it's it's kind of uh, littoral uh, pelagic uh, split, uh, but not that much difference on the profundal and the bit profundal and pelagic ones. This is from the same data, but just on the pairwise comparison. So you can see the pelagic and profundal were actually identical. This is from same data from the structure analysis. So you can see two different clusters. This is more on the littoral part. This is more on the pelagic part. And then you have the profundal and all sorts of mixing here. PC1 also on the genetic data illustrates that you have a cluster on the littoral and then on the pelagic. And the modeling, demographic modeling based on this data actually show that the divergence of this uh, littoral and pelagic fish occurred long, long time back, around 300,000 years back, dating back on, on uh, deep history. They keep on separate littoral, a bit smaller population size than on the pelagic, and they had come on the secondary contact already um, after the last glaciers melt around 20,000 years back. And at, at the present level, they are here. But the divergence is much, much older than we considered that whether it happened on just on this lake. Uh, so, then if we go, what we found with the SNPs. So we identified with this genome-wide associations. We found three SNPs that were located here on the chromosomes 22, 28, and 36 that were significant. A couple of different methods indicate the same, same locations on three SNPs, and they were related on the standardized gonad weight. We know that the coregonids are very prone to show their divergence on the spawning, spawning time and gonad weights are like a proxy on the spawning time. So this gave some support on the idea that the uh, spawning time might have some genetic background. So lastly, I would like to summarize uh, this uh, talk on a few bullet points. We found out that the European whitefish is a highly polymorphic species up to four mobs in a single lake. Uh, the divergence itself relates to both allopatric and sympatric phases, especially taking into account the glaciation cycles. It's not only the most recent, but the many, many cycles back. And littoral pelagic divergence can be very, very old, related on perhaps on the glacial refuges already. And now they are, what we found out is the secondary contact. What we saw very clear, ecomorphological divergence. And, and this, as the most abundant species, it shows wider food web effects. White piece is very prone to hybridize, both within and among the species. And the gene flow likely have significant effect on the observed divergence. Reproductive isolation of whitefish is known for a long time, that it's based on temporal differences on the spawning time. But uh, within this, we get some, some signs that there might be some genome associations on that. We need to think this much, much more broader sense to understand the, this divergence along the glacial history, where there is kind of repeated glaciations back and forth. And, and genetic mixing, and that has perhaps very strong effect on the ecomorphological divergence on, on whitefish and many other corrections too. Lastly, I would like to thank on, on the financial instruments, facilities, especially on the subarctic, many, many people assisting on all bases, a lot of co-authors and so forth. I would like to stress your importance here. This is the sign of Inari County, the Lapland, that they actually combine two key elements. You have the whitefish, large fossilly record whitefish, and then you have the reindeer antlers combined on the county side. 
thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions or comments that you have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kimo. Uh, fantastic talk, covered amazing amount of ground from food webs to genetics, uh, evolution, and uh, it, it's harder to, to express applause in this remote setting, but I think the reaction people can do, maybe a hand clap or something just to give their own appreciation. And um, I, I'm sure we're gonna have questions. Um, you can do questions by raising your hand. Um, participants, I'll try to see you. You could put questions in the chat. Um, and I think it's best if you do raise your hand, th throw your camera on so we can try to make this a little bit more uh, intimate as possible, even though it's uh, through Zoom. Um, so I'll sort of kick us off. Um, and then it looks like we have one uh, from Elvita next, but I loved how you set it up with respect to the differences between what we see in North America, where we have Cisco diverging, more of the complexity there versus uh, in Northern Europe, where it happens to be the whitefish that shows more of the divergence. And, and you talked sort of Vendace in and out of that talk a little bit. And I wondered to what extent Vendace allows for, like how much does Vendace overlap in sort of your polymorphic lakes? So when you have like the large densely rakered or the densely rakered whitefish, does that only happen if Vendace isn't there? Or it looked like you also had Vendace plus those densely rakered whitefish. So I just wondered a little bit about that ecological or evolutionary relationship. Yeah, very good question. And, and Vendace in this region is actually stalked. So it's kind of, you observe whitefish divergence on the systems that didn't have the Vendace. So it's basically, it has been man-made in, introductions on these systems. Always some, Yeah, yeah. So it's basically on, especially the smaller pelagic mob, densely raked whitefish mob, is just the ecological correlate with the Vendace. So it's on, like on some of the larger lakes, like Lake Inari, that is uh, uh, second largest subarctic lake, it's on Vendes has really taken over and, and suppressed the densely raked whitefish. So it's kind of within the time we'll see what's going to happen if, if it disappears completely. But the good question, yeah. And, they, and like the densely raked whitefish, they have more of a terminal rather than a subterminal mouth. Like, I mean, how much morphologically would like a densely raked whitefish compare to a Vendes, which would have more like the terminal mouth? Yeah, yeah, it's a terminal mount and it's on, they have a bit smaller amount of gill rakers than Vendes, so they are not equally efficient as Vendes. So that's kind of, uh, Vendes is perhaps able to trace down the plankton in a smaller size that the densely raked whitefish cannot use it anymore so that's kind of kind of the mechanism and also that the vendes has smaller eggs so it's like uh, more efficient on reproduction i think are selected fascinating okay let's go to uh, elvita hi amazing um hi so yeah a lot of data a lot of effort amazing thank you uh it's more like kind of uh data about this a question about the stabilizer top. So you were showing those plots where you compare different communities and trophic positions. So you draw those ellipses, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if we could go back to those figures. Um, I was just, maybe, could, could we, <laughs> yeah, that would be great. It's more question for, for myself as well to, to learn myself because I never run cyber for communities. I'm just wondering, is it like, I wouldn't like how to say like on the upper upper level, you have one species, right? So I wouldn't expect actually that there is a topic uh, with or the niche of this business like greater when you compare different species. So the, in the lower like level, you have more species, right? So I'm not sure if this really appropriate to compare one species with many species, you know what I mean? 
And then another thing that if you speak about trophic positions, they're like, I know you still see a lot of variability, like, and then I think you should then add a standard deviation and standard errors in general to speak about if you want to really compare the trophic positions. I, I was just wondering how you were treating those data and like, yeah, <laughs> thank yeah. you. Good, good question. So basically it's on, these are all whitefish. These are just on different whitefish marks in the lower row. This is okay. one mob in these lakes. And we standardize the sample size. So we randomly select it around the same amount of individuals in all of the cases. And this is just like including the mobs. So it basically means that if you wanna like just look on the pure like species level that what actually happens if you have the divergence or not, that was the main purpose of on, on this case. Yeah, we have done it already before, like looking on when you have it individually, like on for each of the mob, the isotopic niche. Uh, we have published that, but generally trying to summarize that data is that the specialized mobs, like on this profundal mob here and the small pelagic mob here, they tend to have a smaller tropic niche than the larger mob, especially like the um, large sparsely raked whitefish and the large densely raked. So it's also, if you go on, on the uh, mob level, you can identify uh, the isotopic differences. What is notable, I think here, if you look on this upper row, where you have only one mob, to my mind is the most surprising is that actually some of the cases you can see huge amount of variation within each lake. So it's kind of, uh, to my mind, it suggests that there is, when you have only one mob, you have a lot of potential for individual specialization within the lake when you don't have the other mobs to take over. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Thank. You. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, let's go quickly to one of the comments. Uh, Vic Santucci had a question: Are whitefish stocked in any of these lakes? Either oh. we talked about oh. the bendies. Um, let's see. I'll just look on. Are we talking about exactly on these lakes or like in in Cenera? I think in general in the area, he's just he's yeah. a fishery manager and he's sort of thinking yeah. about yes. these sorts yes. of questions of brown stocking. So is it just vendays that are stocked or also whitefish? There has been some whitefish stockings like uh, on these mountain lakes that I give example on, on the genetic part, but also like on, on this Lake Inari. But none of these that are actually here uh, originating from, from this uh, like further stockings on, on the other mobs. So I think on, if you bring other whitefish mob from different region, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can establish in these systems where you have a lot of other mobs. But uh, in Inari, there is a regulation on this lake, hydropower regulation. So they stock uh, these large sparsely raked whitefish from the same lake. It's on this uh, large growing river type of mob, and that is ongoing, ongoing process. Mm -hmm. These other lakes, like on, they are not, they are not stocked on, on, on these times. It's on white pieces, very dense already on, on, on these regions. Okay. Yep. Hey, Bo, can I, can I jump in on that question? Sure, yeah. I just want to put uh, Nick Boucher on the spot here because he's finishing up an analysis that um, Chuck Bronte and others started a while ago, looking at stocking of whitefishes and uh, corganines in general across uh, the entire range. And there are, um, I think, several hundred records, 230 records maybe of 
whitefish stocking in general. And a lot of those are the European whitefish. Nick, do you offhand remember uh, how many of those records that we retrieved were from Fennoscandia or, or uh, Finland in general? Um, I do not recall offhand, but if you give me about two minutes, I could probably uh, get a quick count for you. Okay, uh, Vic may be interested in that. Sorry to interrupt, thanks. Yeah. Okay, let's go. let's go to Owen, who had his hand up, and then we'll go to you next, Andrew. I think I should be on. You're on. Uh, so a very interesting talk came out. Um, it always gets me wondering, uh, you know, seeing two things that I, I see in the talk is that, you know, these whitefish clades that were uh, showed were, were isolated for 200,000 years. And then more recently with the retreat of the glaciers, they had a recontact re zones. And of course you're probably aware that Randy Eschenroder has done some work here looking at contact zones as the glaciers pull back. Um, and also the, the interesting uh, interactions that you showed uh, of these two uh, vendes and whitefish and how they, they even the hybrids uh, are fulfilling, filling a niche. And it always, in my mind, as I think of these uh, Carrigonines in the whole Arctic region, is this entire group appears to have evolved the ability to evolve. And you know, just as you see in some of those lakes, a single clay comes in and they split up into three different distinct ecomorphs within those lakes. And so, it leads to an amazing level of complexity, but there, it seems to be very orderly in some way. I, so maybe this might be a better question sort of at the end of this, but I'm sure you've had similar thoughts about this. Yes, very, very relevant, relevant question and, and discussion. And, and more and more, I think it's maybe it's also a scientific age thing that when you start, you want to find a detailed differences and you think that there is no gene flow but deeper and deeper you go you find that it's a lot of gene flow between them and perhaps it's as you said it's kind of a what it called jelly type of evolution glaciers go back and forth so you start to diverse then you go back again and so forth so potentially they have so much genetic material that actually when the moment comes, they colonize a new lake, they already have so much genetic variability that you start to observe these mobs almost immediately. And it's kind of uh, put us thinking about uh, so huge rapid evolution, while it's more or less like much more ancient origins and, and kind of they, they somehow evolved to cope with these glaciations over a long, long time. But uh, it's a lot of things to do still on this. I think on Louis Bernaces have used most of his career on trying to, you know, get the um, common patterns or speciation gene on late whitefish and, and always come up that they can do things without any like commonalities. So, so maybe it's more, more common on Corregonits in Cenero. Good question, and a lot of thing, thing to think about. Thanks, thanks, Owen. Um, Nick did respond and talk to give you a sense of what they found with respect to stocking uh, European whitefish in the region. And then we're going to go next to Amanda, just because Andrew is suspecting, and I think he's right that Amanda might ask a follow up related to the genetics question. How did you know? <laughs> Um, so first, Kimo, really, really great talk. I really enjoyed all of this. I mean, it was so nice to see all of this put together, including the ice topic analysis and the genetic analysis. And just, I really enjoyed this. Um, and I wanted to bring up a question that is kind of related to what Owen talked about, which is, I found your demographic analysis really surprising <laughs> compared to the history of, of the whitefish in that Arctic lake. Uh, and I wanted to get your thoughts on, on how you felt about the, the demographic analysis and if you feel like that approach works well also with polyploids. 
um, and and whether the the polyploid state of of salmon might impact or duplicated regions might impact um, the results of a demographic analysis it isn't something I had really thought of before, except that the the species I've seen that style demographic analysis run on um, aren't aren't salmon <laughs> salmon um, and so you know I was curious. Two, if you had looked at the regions of those chromosomes where you found um, distinct areas where these different morphs have differentiated, um, and if those are potentially duplicated regions that could allow for this divergence to occur as rapidly as it is current. Very, very good question, and I have to admit that I'm not a specialist on this, but I can kind of try to open on some of the like the background of this. So basically, it's we don't know the actual founder, what type of white beast they stock there. So it's kind of there is a potential that like on it's already like a mixed stock that they put in. We don't have that's kind of one of the drawbacks. Another thing is that. I'm not sure whether I had it on the slide, but it's very limited number of individuals. It's only six, 61 in total. That somehow kind of also limits a bit. So that's why it is so like on, on suggestive things. What I did look like on those chromosomal regions on like on lake whitefish stuff, I think they used the salmon genomes and found at least one of those regions was the same that they they also think about it. But but in in general, yes, genome duplication, yeah, that's always what we have been thinking and thought about. But but it's it's a very let's say preliminary work. <laughs> this one, it's a limited amount of individuals and, and, and stuff like that. So, so it really requires more work and, and it's a bit unfortunate that it's so it's somehow so time consuming all of this like on, on that and, and, and somewhat also that it, this happens like, let's say case study based. It would have been so much more interesting to do it actually on like a larger scale, but but this is just initial and, and subject to both criticism, but also looking on, on the other system that whether it holds. But that's more or less what I can say about this at the moment. <laughs> well, it was really fascinating. And I also had one other quick question, which is you attempted to pull the mitochondrial sequences out of the RAD data. Um, to see on, if there's multiple mitochondrial clades in that in that stock yeah, population. Yeah, Un unfortunately, that hasn't hasn't been yet done. So let's see, let's see. But uh, there is a lot of I would say there is a lot of avenues here where to go. So so uh, it's it's quite typical in research in general. If you think that you want to answer one question. It's many are waiting for you. All of you know this very well. Thank you. For sure. Well, thanks so much for the answer. That was really, really interesting results, Scott. Thanks. Amanda. Uh, Andrew Muir. Hey, thanks, Kimo. Great talk. Uh, my, my question is uh, probably much less intellectual, but I was really interested in your fatty acid results and I think it was uh, uh, mer meristic acid that emerged as the primary uh, primary fatty acid that was separating those morphs. I was curious because that is not a more common one, I don't think, that you would expect in aquatic food webs. I'm just wondering if you guys looked into the source and what's how that's driving that divergence. Um, yes. That's a good question. You have, I know you have been also playing with these fatty acids with the different species, especially lake trout and stuff like that. So, so basically we found, if I recall 
correctly, it was myristic and palmitic acid and something else. But generally we know this muscle where you analyze this thing is mainly composed of the DHA and EPA. Those are the key fatty acids. But as this muscle has to have a certain type of structure, these are not very informative markers to kind of differentiate on, on the piece itself. So in this case, it just turned out to happen that it was the muristic acid that was kind of the most prone to differentiate these mobs. The, uh, the proportion of muristic acid is very small. It's, if I remember correctly, it's maybe one to three percent. So, but it kind of uh, shows the gradient of the whitefish mobs. And, and it's, it's on, to my mind, I'm sorry, fatty acid people, to my mind, it's all about the fatness of the fish. The things are correlated, also fatty acids. It's kind of, if you look on the linear discriminant axis one, it's more or less you have the littoral left and the profanal right. And it's kind of continuum getting more fat fish. So, so we have been doing quite a bit of fatty acids with many different fish species recently. And, and it's, it's very, very complex, I think, because it's not only about the ecology, but it's the physiological processes that are going on on each of the fish and also each of the season. If you think on what fish have to meet in these regions, we are now both sides, we are around minus 10 and so forth. So they have to cope with the winter too. So, <clears throat> so in that sense, I think I recall uh, to be a bit careful when, when playing with the fatty acids, that it's, it's very complex business. I don't know whether it answers any of your yeah, no, that that makes total sense. Uh, yeah, that that some of the more rare fatty acids are actually more discriminatory, but they're not really telling you much about the ecology of the animals uh, in terms of what they're feeding on or anything. I've seen some uh, N6 like that are that are more common terrestrial fatty acids be more discriminatory than some of the ones you would anticipate in an aquatic systems. So that makes total sense to me. Thanks, Kimo. Yeah, thanks. Kimo, you have a lot of questions coming up. So we're gonna just keep, are you fine with keeping going? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not in a hurry, so keep okay. going. All right, our next one, I think we'll go with Thomas Hook. Hey, Kitos, Kimo. Um, I, was, I was curious about the um, productivity and, and uh, lake productivity and, and the influence on the number of morphs in a lake. You know, if I remember correctly, you suggested that larger, more productive lakes tended to have more morphs, whereas you know, uh, work in Central Europe, you know, they have these lakes that become really productive and they lose morphs and they have hybridization. Um, and so, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the. I don't know if you could separate lake size from lake productivity, but can you talk a little bit more about how you think lake productivity? Uh, structures the number of morphs that that you might see yes very good question and I, I i forget to mention we are talking about low productivity systems here they are all oligotrophic lakes so it's kind of that you just you know if you have a total phosphorus on the small clear water lakes that is uh three uh, micrograms per liter you are raising that on you know five or six or something like that so it's a very low if you get in more productive systems like a mesotrophic or eutrophic lakes, as you mentioned, then you lose coreconids. So, so it should be keep in mind it's we are talking about very you know narrow, narrow range of lakes. All of them can be classified oligotrophic anyway. So, so you are totally right. But we have been in the different uh, aspect been studying a gradients from these oligotrophic lakes down to very eutrophic lakes when you go to south. And you actually even lose the white fish when you turn enough eutrophic systems, they cannot cope anymore. So, so uh, yeah, good, good question. And sorry, I didn't, I was not very clear on my, my, my start. Thank you. 
What do you think is if if you think of just that narrow range of really oligotrophic lakes, what's the how does lake productivity select for or lead to more morphs as opposed to um, you know if resources are limiting in a less productive lake uh, one why would you expect that even at, at those not very productive in those very oligotrophic lakes why would you why does it make sense to have to to see many morphs in those lakes? Um, and not uh, the opposite. Just across that narrow range of productivity yeah, that you're looking at. Yeah. So, so it means on on these cases that you get like both a bit more productive littoral, where you have more benthic animals, because you have a slightly more organic sediment that will raise the amount of benthic animals. And then perhaps also on the pelagic region that it's kind of you get more. When you have a bit more productivity, you get more diverse plankton fauna. And often it's also the altitude is a bit influenced on this, that actually the plankton fauna start to contain a bit more cladocerans also, because the very oligotropic high altitude lakes, they are hugely dominated by the copper pots, kind of perhaps because of the productivity and temperature itself, that it's kind of a uh, kind of uh, supporting this kind of lipid-based copepod dominance because copepods are long-lived, so they they have to whereas cladocerans they are of course very short-lived. So I think it's both on littoral and pelagic productivity that kind of uh, increase and then facilitates that you can observe the divergence. But this, of course, would require much more effort. I think it was a good attempt, Andrew combine all of these circumpolar holomorphic fish data to try to answer some of these questions in a larger scale. But, uh, but uh, let's see, that, that day comes <laughs> one day. But, uh... yeah. and, and there's a very similar question that Vic Santucci has on the chat, I'm sort of wondering about what triggers the, this divergence. And I think Vic, that's kind of with the same, along the same lines that Thomas was asking, and it has parallels, of course, to our Great Lakes, where we have gradients of productivity, and we wonder about how that may allow for the return, or that could have allowed for the uh, for the what we saw historically with respect to Cisco diversity. But uh, Vic, did you want to add anything else around this topic? If you wanted to unmute yourself, yeah, I am unmuted. No, I think Thomas was he hit it, and he he brought up the pro, you know, the differences productivity, even though they're all oligotrophic lakes, cold water, um, that that little change in productivity could be part of it. I, I thought maybe it might have to do with lake size, you know, and depth and that type of thing as well. I, it, it was just curious to me that you, you know, you listed specific lakes where you only have one speed, you know, there's only one more and then other lakes that have, and I'm not familiar with any of these lakes. So um, that's, that's kind of what I asked. I think you answered it, unless there's other factors that, you know, weigh into that. Yeah, it's on, on the area and, and depth are also important. It's mainly related on like the availability of the habitat. We have been many lakes also measured the light level so you can start to calculate the percentage of uh, littoral pelagic profundal and, and it's, it's definitely you need to have enough enough pelagic and profundal to get the mobs there. So, so that's another another aspect also habitat availability and productivity. Yes. Yeah, it was it was impressive to see the speed at which you know in that that one study lake within you said ten generations or fifty years. Yeah, that's pretty quick. <laughs> Yeah, it's it they, they have to have a lot of genetic potential to make yeah. that happen. Very good points. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Vic. Let's go to to, to Nick Mandrak. Stand up patiently. Hello. Um well thanks for a really interesting talk where you're you're putting together the the, the uh, puzzle that is the Corgonid problem. <clears throat> I have a question sort of from the higher level conservation perspective. I'm, I'm on the uh, Committee for the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, and we really struggle with how to, how to uh, uh, protect Corrigonite diversity. 
I wonder what your views are on, you know, um, recognizing the different morphs of species or evolutionarily significant units. And, and in Canada, we call those ESUs DUs. And one of the sort of the key thoughts to the to recognizing a DU is that it's irreplaceable. And when you see this rapid speciation, I, I wonder, you know, to me, it makes me wonder if, if in fact, uh, if they disappear, if they are in fact irreplaceable. What are your thoughts on conserving this uh, this diversity? Yes, very very relevant questions. One once again, so it's all also that you should think about the whole system that you preserve the conditions where the diversion can occur, and that's kind of a, it. It includes the effects on the actual lake or river itself, and also the catchment because it, they are so prone to you know, collapse when you start to change things. So the, so the water quality is important. Regu you should avoid regulation and, and also like on stocking on any other species because that's also one of, one of the key things that if you, when this was raised here, but you can also think about the predatory species if you put like on lake trout or, or northern pike or anything like that on the system, it can, can have an effect. So. So then it's more difficult question is perhaps that it's how unique each of the system are, is. Like on the broad sense, if you think going back all the glaciation, it was a lot of water flow and along the melting and, and they have the option to colonize the system. But of course, it's a long time back. So there has been time to, uh, to change along the current times. So that's more difficult question, but at least they try to prevail the conditions that where the morphs occur. I think that's important. Yeah, thanks. You know, our challenge is our, our legislation really is species based and not ecosystem based. And even though, you know, there's a provision for it, the government to date really hasn't moved forward on the ecosystem side. And, and um, yeah, I, yeah, I, it's obvious based on your your presentation that it's the the uh, the the system that needs the protection. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, very very relevant. We try to we are doing this um, conservation of Arctic flora and fauna, and we try to raise this question that we should really take into account the, the mob thing, whether it's the Corregonids or Salvelinios and stuff like that. But it's very much species based and. And then they even, some of the illustration like put on that where you have the hotspot diversity and cold spot diversity. And quite often it means that actual cold spot diversity, you can see a lot of mobs just because of their, you know, thinking about that. It's all about the species, not the mobs. So, so I think we really need to push hard to get this view that it's important to uh, consider this uh, below species level diversity. Thank Very you. good. Thanks. Great question, Nick, and really relevant for what we're facing uh, in the North American Great Lakes and Nipigon. Um, so let's go. Are you okay to keep going, Chemo? Yeah, Two yeah, more? yeah. There is still okay. a couple of couple of hands raised. So yeah, we going. had I think uh, up to about sixty five participants, and you know I think we could keep going with questions, but we'll cut. We'll we'll, we'll see if. Two more we can get in. So Ted Tresca. Uh, thanks. It was a great presentation. I had um, a two-part question, I guess. I have a picture of what northern Benoscandia looks like, and I picture it as this pristine place. So the question was, is do you have a lot of invasive species up there? And and how much do they change the food? And I'm, and I'm asking just kind of in the in the realm that in the Great Lakes we've had a lot of changes over the last 25 years. We had jacinid mussels that came in, changed the you know, wiped out diapariah. And then, so we saw a lot of, at least when I fish, I saw a lot of white fish with, with uh, velvet, you know, small mussels, that kind of thing. And then as it seemed, they learned, um, you know, gobies came in and they, they started figuring out that those were a good food product. I'm just wondering what you think, you know, or if, if anybody has thoughts on it, you know, how does uh, morphometric, how does the morph, ecomorphs change as the, as the whole food web seems to keep rolling along and how, will, will this, change in morphological stuff just keep becoming more of a soup than, than breaking out into distinct clades. Um, 
just wondering what it, what it's like up there. If my picture of northern Fennoscandy isn't right, or or what you think those impacts of invasive species might be? Yes, very once again very relevant question. So so it depends where you are. Like on this these lakes, what I presented, they were just on the northernmost part of the Finland that are kind of draining to the Barents Sea and Arctic Ocean. So they have this historical element here that many of the southern species were not able to migrate there because of the geographical barrier. Another half is where they can actually migrate. And nowadays, when the climate is warming quite rapidly, and also the catchment is greening, so it means that quite many newcomers are coming in. So we have been studying on this uh, western region. So even within the last 15 years, the European perch, that's very similar to yellow perch in your side, has colonized the new lakes and wipe out uh, some of the whitefish. And it's notable also that when you have this more southern, more boreal species, is that then you don't usually find the polymorphism at all. So they are perhaps very sensitive that if they cannot, this kind of a perch, rough roads, they cannot colonize those most northernmost system. But if somebody stalked them, then I'm expecting that the thing will change completely. Like a rough will definitely wipe out the profundal white fish more. Roads, it's, it's, it's very efficient on reproduction and all that stuff. And perch, kind of uh, the large parsley raked white fish and perch are almost like a complete overlap on the issues and perch can also sit the piscivory so it can start to eat white fish also so it's it's kind of uh, we really need to think how we can conserve these systems in in future yeah thanks and just just to point out it's an interesting you talk about perch and whitefish overlap um i work on green bay here in lake michigan and we've got a pretty good whitefish population and the perch population is coming back and you wonder if there's going to be some kind of it used to be a giant perch fishery and now it's a giant whitefish fishery and, but we'll see yeah. if it coexists or yeah. yeah, it's on it depends on the thermal range. So we recently published a paper on the diet of all of these fish communities along environmental gradients. And it, it's kind of you all know this very well, but it's a white fish is much more like a colder water species than the perch. So it's perhaps also this temperature element that when perch is close to its optimum. It can use massively the individual specialization. Kind of in the cold lakes, perch is, it's a benthic fish, like on it's on the littoral or slope on it. But like on when you get more temperature and a bit more productivity, it can take over also the pelagic part. So it's it's kind of also within the fish communities, if you, even if you don't add anything, but you add a bit temperature and the productivity, you can change the fine tooth balance between the species. All right. Thanks. And there's some other good comments that I think everybody can keep track of in the chat. Um, really great questions. Let's end uh, with you, Chun. Hi, Kimo. Uh, great presentation. And uh, it's also good to see you again after seeing you in Bayfield. Uh, my, my question is more about uh, the grouping. I have been studying Cisco morphology in the last uh, four or five years, and uh, much of our analysis and uh, the way we interpret our results are based on our initial assignment of these groups. And I assume your assignment of your groups are based on morphology and habitat. And uh, um, yeah, there's always some freaks and there's always some potential outliers. Uh, I want to ask you how you deal with those potential misassignment in your initial treatment and uh, in your, and uh, what if you, what would you do if you see those in your analysis? So yeah, that's my question. Yes, yes. We, we start to be in the deep core of the Coreconic <laughs> research. So, so it's on, the lakes are also quite distinct 
like on how different are those mobs. So I think on where I saw those four mobs, they are very distinct lakes that you can actually directly on the field classify them quite well on those four categories. But I, I, I would like to recall that it's not the case in all of the lakes. And it's perhaps kind of remind on how well separated they are, or is it like a complex mixing? So you can have sort of lake that is more or less on almost like a hybrid swarm. Uh, the reason, the underlying reason of this is of course uh, on, on the question and, and it's, it's harder to say, of course, in the most distinct lakes, perhaps you have most of the habitat, habitat availability and kind of uh, they, they have the clear niche segregation. But then like on how it goes with the time, for example, is it like very stable throughout the time? If, if like uh, things change, for example, if it changes the population density of one mob over the others, how it might influence on the other modes. This is, we haven't done really work on this, on this specific question. So um, there is, perhaps I put it that way, there, there is always chance also on this mixing part. It's on, it's, it's, it's after all, it's, it's quite the continuum, I think. Clearest case, you can see a very clear mobs and clear segregation, but looking more and more lakes, you can also find all, all patterns, I think. All right. Well, Kimo, thanks again for a really splendid talk. And it's so interesting to have this discussion of common questions, even with different species, but similar sort of functional roles between our North American small and large lakes and your um, European central and northern European that you're studying, small and large lakes too. And this makes us look forward to the next Corrigonid Symposium. Uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to be all together in person again. So thanks again to everybody. We had over 40 people hanging on here nearly an hour and a half into this. Thanks, Chemo, for being willing to stay on past now six o'clock your time. Uh, and I understand you still have a drive back to get home. So very grateful for the time you spent to share with us. So. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and especially very nice discussion after the talk. This was really, really nice and, and a lot of very relevant questions. So thanks again. And I hope to see you all in next Corregonit meeting latest. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, Thanks, for joining. Have a great weekend.